Dear friends, I'm Professor Filip Kovacevic and this is the 31st edition of the Russian Newspapers Monitor. I hope you are doing well today. I also hope you have been able to contribute to our Kickstarter campaign. It is only with your assistance that we can continue to produce our quality news programming and add even more great content to NewsBud. Please support us because unlike so many other media outlets, NewsBud is a place where media integrity matters. Now, let's take a detailed look at the front page news in major Russian newspapers. What is the mood in the Kremlin? What new international developments the Russian print media is talking about? What is the Russian audience reading and thinking about? And so, let us begin. First today, we'll take a look at the front page of Nezavisimaya Gazeta, the middle of the road newspaper, the edition for April 28, 2017. In the middle of the front page, there is an article with a sensationalist title. There is a chance that NATO may gain access to secret Russian technology. The subtitle explains that the sinking of the Russian naval intelligence ship Lehman in the Black Sea might cost Russia billions of rubles, that is to say tens of millions of dollars. Below the subtitle, there is a photograph of the ship with a caption saying that in all probability Lehman was sailing to Syria. The article reports that the mid-sized Russian naval intelligence ship Lehman sank about 30 miles off the Bosphorus Strait soon after colliding with a cargo ship sailing under the flag of the African state of Togo. In a separate box, the article describes the ship features such as its length, 73 meters, tonnage, 1500 tons, and the number of crew members, 85. In addition, it is stated that Lehman belonged to the Russian Black Sea Fleet and recently took part in several Russian Navy operations in the Mediterranean, the last of which was in January 2017. The article notes that the Russian Ministry of Defense denied reports from the Western mass media claiming that some sailors from Lehman were missing. On the contrary, the ministry stated that they were all alive and well. The article claims that Lehman was equipped with the most advanced Russian spy technology and that this would in no doubt tempt NATO naval forces to get their hands on it as quickly as they can. The depth of the sea at the location where the ship sank is about 100 meters, which is no obstacle for NATO divers. However, as the article points out, the Russian Navy will do everything it can to prevent such an undertaking, and this could lead to the eruption of yet another crisis in the NATO-Russia relations. The ongoing Cold War in the Black Sea could overnight become much hotter. The article cites the statement of the former commander of the Russian Black Sea Fleet, Viktor Kravchenko, who claimed that the loss of Lehman was unprecedented in the recent Russian naval history. According to Kravchenko, quote, there were collisions before, but that the Navy ships would sink in this way I cannot recall happening ever before." End of quote. Kravchenko pointed out that if Lehman sank 
in the territorial waters of Turkey, which is a NATO member state, Russia would need to get the Turkish permission to recover the ship. And who knows whether and under what conditions Turkey would grant the permission. The Turkish president Recep Tayyip Erdogan will definitely find himself under the intense pressure of the NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. Will Erdogan have enough political strength to say another no to Brussels and add further fuel to the fire after so many recent confrontations with the EU and NATO? This remains to be seen. He is scheduled to meet with the Russian President Vladimir Putin in Sochi on May the 3rd. This sudden and substantial loss of a Russian Navy ship brings to mind the crash of the Russian military plane Tu-154 near Sochi in December 2016 when more than 90 people lost their lives. Just like the ship, the plane was going to Syria. While the official version of the crash excludes the possibility of sabotage, there are still questions which are left unresolved. In the case of Lehman, news reports, not cited in this article, which strangely does not report the cause of the collision, claims that the ships collided due to the presence of very dense fog. Perhaps. But taking into consideration the fact that this was a Russian spy ship with the latest technology on board, a clear irritant to the domineering NATO flotilla in the Mediterranean, other possibilities must also be looked at and examined carefully. This could easily be an instance of NATO's Gladio Sea operation against Russia being extended to encompass not only the land, but also the sea. I find it curious that, according to news reports, after the collision, the other ship changed its course, and instead of continuing in the southern direction, it turned north sailing back toward Romania, where it started out from. And it is a fact that at this time, Romania figures as one of the key NATO military and intelligence hubs in Eastern Europe. <laughs>
to take more active part in the fight against terrorism. As can easily be seen, both questions are motivated by the agenda of the Trump administration. Grushko states that at this time, NATO's contribution to the counter-terrorist efforts is limited to training national armies in Tunisia, in Jordan, in Afghanistan, and also in Iraq. These programs are an important component of NATO's overall strategic concept of projecting security. However, Grushko points out that without the Russian cooperation, these programs are most likely doomed to failure. He brings up the case of Afghanistan, where NATO has been present since 2001, and the security situation is getting worse by day. Not only are the Taliban taking under their control more and more of the Afghan territory, but also the production and transport of heroin is flourishing. This, according to Grushko, represents a serious threat to international security. Russia could be of great help in dealing with this threat, but due to the short-sightedness and Russophobia of NATO leaders, it is not even consulted. Grushko claims that in ignoring, and in some cases directly working against Russia, NATO endangers the security of the citizens of its own member states. Grushko notes that many useful joint projects between Russia and NATO one dealing with the advanced technology of uncovering explosive devices in real time have been terminated. This negatively affected the overall security situation in Europe. He states that, quote, there could be no isolated islands of security, end quote, and to think otherwise is a dangerous illusion, which ultimately works in favor of those who want to create chaos in Europe and elsewhere. Another important issue raised by Grushko is the fact that NATO has so far rejected the plan of the president of Finland, a militarily neutral state, which called for all military planes flying in the Baltic region to have their transponders turned on so that all potential misunderstandings could be avoided without unwanted consequences. According to Grushko, NATO's arrogant attitude in this respect directly impacts the stability of the entire region. However, it's important to note that Grushko's critique of NATO is couched in very diplomatic language. His boss, the Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, has been much harsher in his criticism in recent times. It is clear that the Russian strategy in dealing with NATO contains both the carrot and the stick. In other words, Russia is willing to restart cooperation with NATO, but NATO has to abandon some of its recent political positions, such as the demand that Crimea was to be returned to Russia. It is highly unlikely that NATO will do so anytime soon, and so Grushenko's diplomatic discourse is essentially futile. In my opinion, and let me state this bluntly, NATO is geared toward regime change in Russia and its closest allies, Belarus and Kazakhstan. The recent examples of the Operation Gladio Sea, which I've described in the previous episodes, demonstrate that clearly. As the first NATO Secretary General, the British Lord Ismay, openly confessed, the role of NATO is, quote, to keep the Americans in, the Russians out, and the Germans down. Not much changed in 70 years. 
the only way for the Americans, Europeans and Russians to work together on an equal footing and with mutual respect is to disband NATO and send to peaceful retirement the anti-Kremlin ideologues who are running it. But this appears just as likely as Russia returning Crimea to Ukraine. In other words, tensions will continue to build up in Europe. And by the end of the year, we may see the eruption of some new violent hot spots. Moldova, Bosnia, Macedonia are on the top of this list. <laughs>
stated that Merkel's visit was connected to the recent visit to Moscow by the EU Foreign Minister Federica Mogherini. According to Kosachov, Germany wants to keep the leadership position in the EU, and this is why it was important for Merkel to be seen in direct communication with Putin and keep its own line of negotiation with Russia separate from the Brussels bureaucracy, which is rapidly losing its legitimacy across Europe. However, Kosachov did not think that there would be any breakthroughs during the talks any significant changes, if at all, could take place only after the German parliamentary elections in September. According to the German opinion surveys cited by the article, at this time, Merkel is doing better than her opponent from the Social Democratic Party, Martin Schulz. If the elections were held today, Merkel would get 37% of the vote, while Schulz would get 29%. And so it appears likely that Merkel might get another mandate as chancellor. Still, in my opinion, it is much too early to predict correctly the eventual election outcomes, though I think that the Russian government would prefer Merkel to Schulz. In his past position as the head of the European Parliament, Schulz has turned to be one of the most vocal Russophobic politicians in Western Europe. He seems to cherish a personal dislike of Putin, and this is definitely something that the Russians are very sensitive about, especially as Putin is getting ready to announce his candidacy for the March 2018 Russian presidential elections. Lastly today, let's take a look at the Russian semi-tabloid press, the newspaper Komsomolskaya Pravda, probably the most widely read newspaper in Russia, the edition for April 28, 2017. On the upper part of the front page, there is an article with a dramatically shocking, sensationalist title. A terrorist act is being prepared to take place during the Eurovision in Kiev. The Eurovision is a very popular annual song contest in Europe, which is widely watched all over the continent. Above the title in black letters, it is stated that this statement comes from a military expert who correctly predicted the recent assassination of the former Russian parliamentary deputy Denis Voronenkov, which took place in Kiev. Below the title, there is a photograph of the Kiev main square with a sculptured sign for the Eurovision in the middle. This square, known as the Independence Square, was the main location of the so-called Euromaidan protests, which led to the overthrow of the President Viktor Yanukovych in February 2014. The article continues on page 4 of the newspaper. It reports the statement of the Russian military expert Alexander Zhilin, who is apparently well-connected with the military and intelligence networks in Kiev. According to the article, he was able to predict the assassination of Voronenkov a month before it took place. Zhilin claims that he received a secret report from his sources in Kiev that the Ukrainian Domestic Security and Intelligence Agency, SBU, together with its Western sponsors, was preparing a terrorist act in Kiev. This act is supposed to take place during the Eurovision contest, perhaps even at the contest venue during the live TV broadcast. Planned as a typical false flag operation, this act would then be blamed on the Donbass rebels. It would be used as a pretext 
to position the UN or the EU peacekeepers in the Donbass to serve as the cover for the eventual Ukrainian military invasion at some later date. It should be recalled that this appears to be the same scenario that was used more than 20 years ago in Croatia against the Serb-controlled regions. As the result of the extensive Croatian army attack, with the direct logistic and media support of NATO member states, hundreds of thousands of Serbs were expelled from their centuries-old homes, never to come back. Now, according to Zhilin, the same tragic fate is being planned for the pro-Russian Donbass residents. Zhilin also added that another expected consequence of this act would be to terminate the plans for a summit meeting between the U.S. President Donald Trump and the Russian President Vladimir Putin and push Russia even further into the role of an international pariah, now even with the label of a state supporting terrorism. Asked about his motivation for making such controversial and shocking claims, Zhilin said that he decided to make this information public because that was the only way to prevent the horrendous deed. In other words, the other side will see that its cover has been blown and is likely to give up on the operation. In my opinion, the fact that such a widely read and popular newspaper as Komsomolskaya Pravda published this article on the front page shows that the Russian military and intelligence networks consider it likely that there could be some kind of dramatic flare-up of violence in Ukraine and that Russia would get blamed for it. This is why they decided to act preventively and via the statements of Zhilin, who is no doubt an operative, signal to the other side, including of course the CIA, the MI6 and the BND, the main mentors of the Ukrainian SBU, that they know that a certain type of a false flag operation, not necessarily the one that is described in the article, is being planned. Now that the Western intelligence agencies know, that the Russians know, and that the Russian public knows that they know that they know, the whole thing might be dropped for a while. But there is no reason to expect that it will be abandoned altogether because the crisis in the Donbass is far from being resolved, the Minsk Accords have been violated by both sides, while the deadly shooting across the lines of separation goes on daily, unless there is a far-reaching deal between Trump and Putin this summer, the war is likely to reignite by September. Friends, this is all for today. Thank you for your time. Please support our Kickstarter campaign. And of course, be cool and stay cool until the next edition of the Russian Newspapers Monitor. You are generous supporters and community members are the reason we exist. You are the power that has kept us operating and expanding towards this amazing success. And you are the sole determinant of the continuation and steady expansion of Newsbot operations. Please join us. Join the Newsbot movement by kindly and generously pledging towards this 100% people-funded media with integrity. Yes, we have accomplished a lot. But this is only the beginning and that is my promise to you.